All right, can you hear me okay? Yep, we can. Can, yeah. can you see the, the slides okay, the right size? Um, is that yep. a yes? Yes, yes. Well, thank you, thank you very much, Banu. Okay, well, thank you very, very much for in, uh, inviting me to participate in this uh, um, summit. Um, I've just learned a lot, and, uh, um, and, and there's also some really interesting contrasts between a countrywide um, state-developed um, insecticide resistance monitoring and what I am about um, to tell you, um, what we are experiencing here, um, specifically in New Jersey. So um, the title of my talk is uh, Life After Insecticide Resistance Was Detected or Is Detected and, and really is a conversation. I, I developed this talk specifically to talk to the mosquito control programs in New Jersey. Um, now, it, it's sort of important, and, and I'm basically speaking to the converted, but uh, that insecticide resistance can impact control. And, you know, in Malaysia, in Mexico, this may be completely obvious to everybody, but actually it's still often not obvious um, to some of the constituents that we work with. So there are... There is evidence um, from publications that um, at, in larval stages, insecticide resistance is originally associated with a reduction in the duration of the treatment efficacy that can be seen, for example, as normally you would, you would have eight weeks of control. And if you have some level of, of resistance, you may only have three weeks of control. And if it gets really bad, you may have very little control or none. And this has been shown in the Caribbean, Brazilian populations. I'll show the references in one minute. Um, there's also evidence um, of both larval and adult um, resistance uh, that even after three rounds of uh, ultra low volume thermal fogging uh, with delta metrin, you saw no actual um, changes in the, in the numbers of biting um, adults and also of, of larvae. Um, and sort of more recently sort of to do here with uh, um, in US, we have seen failures of applications of pyrethroids in Florida, um, sort of implicated in the um, loss of control for controlling Zika transmission in Miami. So, and again, these slides will be sl uh, shown, uh, I guess, shared. And so um, the, the references are here. I always reference um, whenever I'm, I'm sort of saying anything. Now, working my lab, I'm, I'm a basic scientist, um, or I'm primarily a basic scientist. And, and it, when I started working on Asia, Asian tiger mosquito in 2008, and sort of later on, um, brought in uh, Sebastien Marcom uh, that had, was trained in Vincent Corbel um, in Montpellier um, on sort of the intricacies of, of insecticide resistance testing. And it was sort of my introduction to insecticide resistance. Marcom does a fantastic job of looking at um, insecticide resistance in, in Iris albopictus, in mostly in the Eastern US. He looked at populations from New Jersey, Pennsylvania, and Florida, multiple populations. And he tested 11 different insecticides, including all modes of action, starting with DDT, and both all larvicides and adulticides. Um, he also characterized the susceptible strain of Iris albopictus that is now available from BEI resources um, called the ATM New Jersey 95. Um, that was important as a, as a way to create a, a baseline that we could then compare and, and evaluate the, any kind of levels of resistance in field populations. Uh, during that study, uh, Sebastian also found incipient and some moderate resistance to both organophosphates, OPs, and pyrethroids in populations in New Jersey and also um, in, in, in Florida. And of, of interest, he found DDT resistance in Edis albopictus in Florida. Um, not associated with a KDR uh, mutation, but we suspect actually directly associated with a DTTAs, a, 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 a detoxifying enzyme that was specifically uh, associated with um, DDT. And that was sort of surprising. Um, Albopictus didn't get to Florida until 1990, until 1986 or some, somewhere around, maybe 89. Um, and uh, DDT had been outlawed um, since uh, 1972 in the United States. So this idea that migrating mosquitoes, mosquitoes coming in already with insecticide resistance were, were an important. So we've talked about some great presentations on the origin of insecticide resistance and 
frankly, a, a mutation is a relatively unlikely thing to happen. So often, as has been mentioned, you already have a nice sort of brew of more or less resistant mosquitoes in a population, and then you can either drive them to an increase or, or not. Um, later on, I uh, had a, a student, um, I had a student, uh, Brian Johnson, that looked at, you know, I mean, sort of what uh, um, Sebastian did were bioassays, but um, the Brian was interested in looking at, since we had the tools for in Culex pipians to actually look at the molecular basis of insecticide resistance in a comparison of residential and wetland Culex pipians here in New Jersey. Um, he found for the first time, not because it was the unknown in the US, but it had never been done in New Jersey, um, the combination of, of uh, ester 2 A1B, I'm sorry, A2B2, and also ester B1, uh, upregulated esterases that confer uh, OP resistance in Culex pipians, and also the classical KDR mutation L1014 uh, at a relatively high rate and finding uh, evidence of uh, positive selection, so higher numbers of homozygotes than expected from the numbers of heterozygotes. He also found do double mutants of the ester, upregulated esterases, and also KDR mutations, which really becomes a problem when you're trying to do any kind of rotation between the only two class of insecticides available to us for public health of, of adulticiding in, in New Jersey, OPs and pyrethroids. So after I, I done this work, um, I, I later on became the director, which I am now, the director of the Rutgers Center for Vector Biology. And um, this is a program that was originally known as the Mosquito Research and Control Program. Um, we do basic research on vectors and pathogens, ecology, evolution, surveillance, and control, so basic science and operational. Uh, and we work in close association with uh, New Jersey's 21 county mosquito control programs and also New Jersey residents. Um, we have multiple and regular institutional collaborations with other professional organizations in New Jersey and, and beyond. Um, and we have, you know, a nice lab. We can do a lot of things. Uh, we get a lot of federal and state funded projects. And uh, because of all of this, I became involved in, in the WIN, the Worldwide Insecticide Resistance Network uh, that was, again, started um, in Montpellier by uh, uh, Vincent Corbel and uh, Jean-Philippe David, um, and then expanded to 19 um, countries. Um, and included me as representative of uh, the Center for Vector Biology. This is, again, was a big learning experience for me um, and really trying to think about and, and what sort of this comparison between uh, statewide approaches and what we have here in the United States, which is literally sort of mom and pop. So it's local um, development of, of control, locally funded. Um, and because of that, um, it can, it can be a, a very flexible and, and very powerful approach, but it can also make, maybe, and this is where the discussion starts, a little bit of hard on the upkeep, on sort of deciding to do something. Now, as part of multiple papers that came out of the win, here's a complicated slide that is complicated on purpose. Um, developing a insecticide resistance um, management program, it really requires sort of the main pillars of surveillance, research, management, innovation, financial support, and otherwise, including advocacy, um, that then requires a, a view of short-term, you know, one to two year situation analysis, the surveillance, understand what's, what's present in terms of insecticide resistance, and frankly, starting before you see insecticide resistance. So management and rotating uh, the use of insecticides and doing it all this in, a, in an enlightened and scientific um, way. Um, then you have the actual IRM implementation in two to five years, and basically a, a long-term sustaining of the insecticide resistance management. It's a complex process. It's, it requires kind of a, a satellite view of what's going on. And so where are we? Well, I'm also part of, so the, as a member of the Center uh, for Vector Biology, we're part of the Northeast Vector-Borne Disease, the Centers of Excellence. So this is created by CDC. Um, and the NEVBD um, started in 2019, they did a survey to try to understand how much pesticide use and how much resist resistance monitoring, insecticide resistance monitoring was happening in the Northeastern US, which is kind of the, from Maine to Virginia, it's kind of our sphere of influence. Uh, the idea was to determine the current extent 
determine roadblocks uh, in, in, if, if insecticide resistance um, monitoring was not being done, and also how NEVBD could help um, to address this. So the results were basically that there was a lot of lack of training and equipment, um, lack of dedicated funding, time, because you needed more personnel, and, and in many cases, because again, these are local county mosquito control programs. And as I mentioned, there's 21 counties um, in, in New Jersey, sort of equivalent of uh, 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 relatively, so New Jersey is about 9 million people. Um, and as again, separated into about 21 counties, they're pretty high density um, and they're locally funded. So the, the funding, although there's some funding coming from the state, most of the funding is local. Um, and most of them are, they do control. So finding an area where they can maintain mosquito colonies is kind of a complicated thing to do. So as a response to this, um, the NEVBD decided to create a centralized pesticide resistance monitoring program. It was initially started by, um, led by James Bordes, um, supported by uh, Joe Poggi, um, Emily Mader is the manager, and Laura Harrington is the director. Um, since then, now Lindsay Baxter is organizing this. I'm not giving you results about this, this particular program. Um, I'm showing you some of the results that they have shared at this point and published. So they started this, this program. It started in 2019. They have data from 2020, 2021, where they basically ask anybody, any, any pro program across the Northeast to submit um, the sample, submit eggs or submit um, larvae or adults uh, for them to test. And they do that for, for free. So basically it's just a question of the program sending in um, the, the, or the specimens. The, what they found the primary, so the, in the survey, the primary insecticides used in the Northeastern US, again, from Maine to Virginia, for the larvicides is primarily Bacillus thuringiensis israelensis, BTI, with some level, significant amounts of uh, Lysobacillus spherichus. Um, in terms of the uh, non-biologicals, uh, the methoprene, so a juvenile hormone mimic, is used uh, extensively, it's primarily in an urban area, is used for catch basin mosquitoes, for Culex pipiens mosquitoes, and routinely, but not always, again, these are individual uh, programs, uh, they, do, they treat thousands of catch basins by applying a briquette of methoprene to, to consider, to be able to control uh, the production of Culex pipiens throughout the season. Small amounts of organophosphates and, and a few others. For the larvicides, the, the big bulk of the control is uh, pyrethroids. So 76% of the adulticiding is done with pyrethroid, has been mentioned already, is considered to be least impactful to, um, to humans in, um, in other you know, invertebrates. Um, there is some application of, of melathion OPs, but really uh, the pyrethroids are, are the primary uh, mode of control for, for adulticiding. Now, in terms of, of resistance, um, there has been detection of moderate to significant resistance to methoprene in New Jersey and Culex pipiens. Not surprising, since, as I just mentioned, uh, methoprene is one of the primary, is the primary method of control of these catch basin mosquitoes. It was not found in Edis albopictus, and I should also mention these are the only two species that have been targeted uh, at, at, at this point for insecticide resistance testing. And there's also been uh, observation of, of moderate levels of pyrethro pyrethroid resistance, including etomfenprox, um, for both Culex pipiens, for Culex pipiens and, and in some populations of Edis albopictus. Okay, so um, insecticide resistance has been detected in your mosquitoes. Now what? And that's really where I'm coming in. So as, as a, a member of the Center of Vector Biology, my job is to support mosquito control programs. And so I want to work with them. I want to help trying to figure out what exactly is the best step forward now that some insecticide resistance has been detected. And I've already mentioned, technically, we should have been doing insecticide resistance management to prevent any insecticide resistance detection. But as also has been uh, discussed, just because you find insecticide resistance in a particular um, strain uh, a collection of mosquitoes that was submitted does not mean that you have um, you know, widespread insecticide resistance in your population. So according to the CDC, if you, if you have, if you find some level of insecticide resistance, if you're still susceptible, do some baseline um, enzymatic, so 
P450 asterisk testing. Um, really interesting, then uh, we'd love to have a discussion with uh, my Malaysian colleague about those rapid assays. Um, if you find some resistance, do some mechanism testing using uh, synergists um, and do, do some field testing. We'll talk about that in a second. And then if you see significant mortality resistance, then start looking at alternative modes of control. So that's basically the idea, but also a lot of discussion about spatial extent, temporal extent, great work, really enjoyed the, the work from Mexico and, and understanding this, this large scale to very local scale um, development presence of insecticide resistance. So, and then this idea of sort of change control methods. Um, and, and it is important to mention that reactive alternation is not technically insecticide resistance. And, and I just want to, I think you all know that, but I just want to point out why this is especially important. The fact is that you can have high levels of resistance and they, those can be hard to reverse. They can be hard to reverse because the population may now be homozygous. And that has been detected. Populations in Florida and California of Edis aegypti have been found to be totally homo homo homozygous for um, the, the KDR mutation, one or more, um, and therefore, it doesn't matter if you um, um, change uh, your insecticide, um, the, the, it's not going to go away. You may change to OPs, but you're not going to be able to come back to, to pyrethroids easily. Um, you can have multiple resistance mechanisms. As I mentioned, we found both KDR mutations and upregulated esterases in the single, in, same, in the same mosquito um, in, in New Jersey. So uh, rotating these two modes of action, it is not going to necessarily do much uh, in terms of changing uh, the, the, the increase in insecticide resistance. Um, of course, as mentioned, presence of additional selection from agriculture and household insecticide use, really good work in Mexico. <laughs> I really, really enjoyed that, those, that talk. Um, and also the effect of insecticide resistance on vector competence, which has been shown both in Edis aegypti and thank you, um, Dr. Wangi, on in Anopheles gambi. So you can see I've been updating my talk as I was listening to everybody. So it's been fun. Um, so what are the resistance management strategies that, can, that I can go and talk to mosquito control programs about? Well, again, rotation, we need to understand uh, residual, we need to understand generation time, and then come up with a strategy to, to do rotation of insecticides. That is easier said than done. Uh, this idea of mosaic may not work for mosquitoes that are uh, like it is Egypt or it is Albopictus, very weak flyers. And so what's the size of a mosaic um, for, for a situation like this? Um, and then these mixtures, which we are seeing um, are already starting, people starting to use, um, but I'm seeing mostly larvicides with, with adulticides, which is actually an interesting and definitely something to explore. Um, so we're not seeing, um, we need to have a situation where there's no cross resistance, no the residual, it needs to be the same for the two um, modes of action. And also um, it's important to understand the genetic basis. So what I would like, what I would really like to be able to, to work with my constituents, I would like a better understanding of insecticide resistant dynamics in our mosquito populations, type and levels of insecticide resistance, which will require these rapid insecticide resistance strategies, markers, and of note, and I really want to talk to um, my colleague in Malaysia, um, but we also need methods for non-traditional species. In, in New Jersey, the, the big species that we control the most is Edis solicitans, the, the salt marsh mosquito. Uh, it is, can be a vector of eastern equine encephalitis and is a tremendous nuisance, which is actually the primary driver of control of mosquitoes here in New Jersey. We have hardly any methodology for that species. We're now developing the sort of whole genome sequencing for that species to try to identify some of these, you know, KDR, esterases, and other markers. We have nothing for it right now. Um, we also have the, the need for understanding spatial and temporal trends in insecticide resistance. What are the drivers of insecticide resistance and measures of fitness costs of resistance that we always assume are going to be there. Therefore, when you stop applying insecticides, the mosquitoes are going to revert to susceptible, but are really quite varied and uh, depends on the species and depends on the, on the insecticide. And again, it depends on if they're homozygous or not. We also need a quantitative measure of insecticide impact on local mosquito control. And that's something that I'm very interested in the next talk by Dr. McAllister, um, you know, and how are we going to address 
every every single location is different. Insecticide resistance is happening at different levels, at different species, in the in the in at, for different reasons in different parts of our of our our areas. Um, how are we going to be able to control? What are the strategies for for doing this? We need alternative tools for mosquito control for sure, new actives, um, and also non-insecticide approaches that will work in an emergency. And and that's really um, the big the big the big one. This is my contact information, and um, thank you.